Visual imagery is our ability to form mental images of things and events. It is a familiar aspect of most people's everyday experience. In fact, only a few individuals report never consciously experiencing any kind of imagery. If you think about it, the English language has many sayings that indicate there's a relationship between what we see and what we think. For example, to understand something is called seeing it. We try to make our ideas clear by bringing them into focus. We even refer to the mind's eye. But visual imagery is not just pictures in the head. We can develop imagery for all of the other senses. For example, we can remember the appearance of something, the feel of something, the smell of something. Uh, we can mentally imagine the sound or the flavor of something. So even though we talk about visual imagery most often, and that's where a lot of cognitive psychology research examines, just bear in mind that imagery can be and does exist in the other domains of sense. So there is a big ongoing debate in cognitive psychology about the nature of mental imagery, particularly if the, the mechanisms that help us to perceive and see in the world are the same things that help us to mentally image. Coslin is one of the main researchers that are currently looking into this, and he developed what he called the mental scanning technique. He would ask participants to imagine an image such as this boat you see on your screen, and then he would ask them to mentally scan from one point to another, and then he would re record how long it would take. So for example, he would ask them to start at the back of the boat, at the motor, and he would say, okay, scan to the porthole, and then record how long that took. And then he'd say, do it again, start at the motor and scan all the way to the front of the boat where the anchor is. And he compared their scanning times. And he found that just like perception, it took people longer to scan when the distance was greater. So Coslin said, if imagery like perception is spatial, it should take longer to mentally scan objects that are located further away from the initial point. And this is exactly what he found. And he said, this is suggests that imagery and perception are spatial. Lee criticized this. He said that it was the fact that there were more distractions when they were doing that mental scanning across those longer distances that have could have increased that reaction time. So Coslin came back and did some more experiments to prove that it wasn't a distraction issue. So for example, he might have given people uh, the, the request to imagine a map, let's say a map of the United States. And let's say we're here in North Carolina. He would say, imagine you flying, if you were a bird, uh, from North Carolina to Florida. And again, he would take a, a measure of the reaction time, the scanning time. And then he'd say, imagine you're in North Carolina and now you're flying to California. And he would measure their scanning time. Once again, people took a lot longer to scan from North Carolina all the way over to California then from North Carolina to Florida. And there was nothing distracting in the middle, so there wasn't, they were stopping along the way, along Route 66. Um, so it wasn't a distraction issue. Just to make sure, he did another experiment again, very similar idea. He created a map of an island, and there were seven different locations with 21 possible trips. For example, between a lake to a tree, or a lake to a hut, the lake to the, the beach, and so on. And once again, Coslin found that people took longer to scan between the greater distances, and he used this as evidence, once again, that visual imagery, just like our perceptual processes, is spatial. In fact, when you plot the results on a graph, it looks just like this, an almost perfect pos positive correlation between 
the distance as it increases to the reaction time, a nice straight line. Once again, Costler did another experiment and he wanted to examine the relationship between how close you were to seeing something in your mind's eye, the viewing distance, and the ability to perceive details. So he would ask participants, imagine an elephant and a rabbit. And he would ask them, does the rabbit have whiskers? And on the whole, it took participants about two seconds to answer that question. But what's interesting is that he then asked them to imagine a rabbit next to a fly. And he asked the same question, does the ra rabbit have whiskers? And participants took a lot quicker to answer that question because the rabbit had so much more detail. So they were quicker to detect the details on that larger image that fills the visual field. In another experiment, he did what was called the mental walk task. He would ask participants to imagine themselves walking towards a mental image of an animal, for example, a dog. They then had to estimate how far away they were from the animal when they experienced what he called overflow. And that basically means that the details of the animal were so close that they filled the visual field. What he found then was that people had to move closer for smaller animals than for larger animals, just like we would do in real life if we were seeing them. You wouldn't have to move so close to an elephant for it to fill your visual field as opposed to a gnat. So once again, Costlin said, images like perception are spatial in nature. So there seems like there's quite a lot of convincing evidence, but not everyone agrees with Costlin. In fact, there's what's called the imagery debate. So, so far, we've seen quite a lot of evidence to indicate that we see images or pictures in the mind, and that's called spatial representation. So for example, when we try to imagine a cat sitting under a table, we might think of a picture very much like this, and that's a spatial representation. Other researchers actually say that the underlying representation of the images that we experience in our head are actually based on symbols and language. So for example, we might experience and see this in our mind's eye, but the underlying representation is based on words. And this is called a propositional representation. Pelishin is one of the big critics of Koslin and his research on the spatial nature of imagery. He suggests that just because we experience imagery as spatial doesn't mean the underlying representation is spatial. And in fact, he refers to spatial representation as an epiphenomenon. Basically, that means that it's something that accompanies the real mechanism, but is not actually a part of it. So Pilishin is saying that we might experience images in the head, but it's not really the fundamental nature of the processing form. An analogy to make sure that you understand this is that in movies where they often will show um, a computer bank, uh, for example this picture over here, they will show lots of lights flashing to indicate that the computer is on and is processing. Those lights have no part of the actual running of the computer, but they are trying to show that the computer is running. And that's what Pilishin is saying that imagery is doing for our brain. It's not part of the actual underlying mechanism, but that's what we see and that's what we experience. So for Pilishin, the mechanisms of mental imagery is not fundamentally images or pictorial in nature. In fact, relationships are represented as symbols or words. So remember Coslin's boat? If we're trying to imagine that boat, we would have an image of that. But Pilishin was saying that the underlying representation of this would be symbolic. For example, using words 
to represent objects and lines as the relationship between objects. So you'd have these symbols, words, saying propeller, handle, and then having links to each of the different components. The length of the line indicates the distance between the parts. The words, of course, indicate the parts of the boat. And the words in the parentheses that you see indicate the spatial relationship. So Pilishin would say that, of course, it would take longer for us to scan from the motor to the porthole because we've only got three links here. That if we scan from the motor to the anchor, motor, rear deck, front deck, anchor, it would take longer. So Pilishin can use his argument to explain the increased scanning time found by Koslin. Pilishin also said that he could explain Koslin's scanning result by what he called the tacit knowledge explanation, which basically means that we have real world knowledge um, about, for example, what a boat looks like in real life and that the motor is the furthest point away from the front of the boat and the anchor. And he says that we use that real world knowledge unconsciously. So when people are participating in the scanning experiments, they unconsciously know that it will take longer to scan from the back to the front of the boat, and so they take the extra time. To test this, Fink and Pinker did an experiment where they were flashed up dots pretty quick, and then they saw an arrow, and they had to, to judge whether the arrow was pointing to um, the location of a dot that was previously seen. What they found was that there was a longer reaction time when there was a bigger distance between the arrow and the dot. Fink and Pinker said, basically because the dots were flashed up so quickly, there was no time to memorize this information, so that it wasn't based on previous experience, it wasn't tacit knowledge. So once again, this is support for Koslin's idea that imagery is spatial in nature and it's not to do with tacit knowledge or previous knowledge about something. So can we resolve the imagery debate? Is imagery like perception and spatial in nature? Well, we can use brain imaging technology to see uh, and basically it indicates that there is the same part of the brain are active when we are perceiving something and mentally imaging something. For example, participants were asked to perceive an object and you can see part of the brain that's active and then the stimulus was turned off and so that part of the brain stopped being active. Then they were asked to imagine the object. So that same part of the brain that was previously active when they were perceiving it is also now active when they're imagining and they were told to stop imagining the object and that part of the brain goes away, stops that firing, and then they see the object again. So you can see that there are the same parts of the brain are active in both perception and imagery. There are many parts of the brain that deal with spatial imagery and spatial perception. Uh, the parietal lobe, parts of the temporal, frontal and occipital lobes are all important as well as the subcortical structures in the brain. So numerous studies indicate that there are several parts of the brain that inv are involved in both imagery and in visual and propositional form. The problem of exactly how these images are stored and manipulated still remains an area of fertile study.